Welcome to tonight's rescheduled London Luminaries Lecture, the last of the series of 14 lectures, historic properties working together to celebrate our history. So I get the delight and the pleasure to welcome our fantastic chair for this evening, it's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to those of you who behind the scenes have worked to make this talk possible, in particular, Chris, one of our volunteers who's done amazing work uh, this time round. And thank you to our audience for um, bearing with us as we had to reschedule this talk through um, circumstances beyond anyone's control. This is going to be like that little um, set of you know, tasty seeds or um, pity for that little chocolate mint that the waiter brings you with your, your bill. This is a little added extra to our series on food and drink. Those of you who've attended our talks in the past will know that the London Luminaries grew out of an initiative to, to celebrate the community of people who lived in the area west of London area, particularly rich culturally and also financially because of its proximity to centers of, of power. And we've been delivering talks for a number of years, all of which are available for you to view on YouTube afterwards. You'll be able to find others in this, in this series on food and drink, but also our previous series. Um, the talks are delivered live with a, a question and answer session at the end, but the question and answer session isn't included in the recording. It's, it's part of what makes the live event distinctive and it helps us connect with our audiences. Now, our audiences have been so important to us throughout uh, the, the COVID lockdown and afterwards as well, building up relationships with, with people who might become volunteers or visitors now that the properties are all open. So let me at last introduce our speaker. I'm so delighted to have back John Collins, who's spoken for us before very entertainingly. And John Collins, as you may know, is a senior manager for historic houses at the London Borough of Hounslow. And he's overseen Hogarth's house since it reopened to the public after major refurbishment in 2011. He also is in charge of Boston Manor House. Hogarth's house and garden are well worth a visit, as is the subject of his talk tonight, Boston Manor House. Over to you, John. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. The subject of the talk today is in the fields and on the table. Um, we have Boston Manor House uh, in the image you can see on the screen right now. But what we're going to do is talk not just about the house itself, but about the estate which the house commanded um, over time and how the estate makeup both produced um, food and drink and how the house itself consumed those, but also what other things that they uh, consumed in the house that weren't available on the land and, and how that changed over time. Um, we're gonna go right back to the beginnings of Boston Manor House and that takes us to 1086. And it's important to establish those boundaries for a quite obvious reason, um, which should become apparent in just a moment, that the present site of Boston Manor House um, was probably part of the parish of Hanwell in 1086 in the hundred of Ellathorne, uh, and it was owned by the Abbot of Westminster. Um, the manor itself was created by someone called uh, Gervais de Beauvoir in the 12th century, and he was an illegitimate son of King Stephen. What's interesting and relevant for us for today's talk is the boundaries of the estates that were formed. In the south, it was the Thames. Uh, to the west, it was the River Brent. And in the north, it's roughly where Boston Manor Tube is today, if you know the area. So you're looking at a relatively long and thin stretch, but orientated around the Brent and the Thames as natural boundaries. And one of the things that seems to have happened in carving out this, um, this area is that it's a very economically viable um, producing bit of land that's been carved out. It includes farmlands, includes things like fisheries. There are some well-established medieval fish ponds that go on to form what is now the lake at Boston Manor. But there's also records of things like water meadows being present. And water meadows are very important for creating grasses, which can be harvested and fed to livestock as well. So the very founding of um, this 
whole Boston Manor uh, piece of land is around the fact that it's an economically productive piece of land. And food production is a big part of the early history of the house, not just the fact uh, that they would later consume vast amounts of food that we'll come on to. Um, the house isn't appearing in the Doomsday Book, the, the estate doesn't appear, but we know it still belongs to Westminster. And we start to get some uh, bits of information in the uh, 12th century about what's going on with food production as part of the estate. In the late 12th century, Edward I grants the manor to the Prior of St. Helens in Bishopsgate. And you can see a uh, near contemporary uh, etching on the left and the still surviving St. Helens Church in Bishopsgate in the centre of London on your right there. Where it's interesting to our subject today is that it's most likely that this was used as a grange, which is a type of farm that's run by and for the benefit of a religious order. And there's further credence to that because uh, when we get to 1306, Edward III grants the right to hold a weekly market because there was excess food that needs to be sold. So it's a very productive piece of land for the church. Um, and the order is able to have regular markets thanks to that grant, but also they're granted a six day fair to sell the produce on the eve of St. Lawrence's day. So they've got more than they need from this estate. Um, it's a good estate for producing. And what's interesting is, as over time, um, you can imagine as we speed through uh, English history, once you get to um, Henry VIII and possessions that are in the hands of religious orders slip into, um, private isn't the, quite what, the right word, but slip into the hands of other people. And the same happens with the estate at Boston Manor. Um, the current house from which I'm speaking to you at the moment, and the one that we saw on the first slide, uh, is the second house that was built um, on this land. And it was built in 1623 for Lady Mary Reed. Um, for most of its life, though, the house is um, part of the possessions of the Clitheroe family, who buy the house in 1670. And we have to jump forward now because it's from them that we have an enormous amount of information about the position that the house and its estate were in 500 years later. Um, we are, of course, slaves to the surviving bits of historic record. So we jump forward now and we go to 1698. So the house has been in the hands of uh, the Clitheroe family. Um, at that point, there is a man called Christopher Clitheroe who creates what's called a long book. And it really is a long book. Um, in it, though, he keeps... Um, a large record of his holdings and continues to update it. Christopher's records in his long book talks about all his real estates, his personnel valued early. This volume includes rentals and after listing several tenant farmers and their field names. So at this point, the estate has become one which is tenanted to different farms. We see the quote in front of us here from James Clitheroe in 1718. I should note at this point that as we talk about Clitheroe's, they have a family naming tradition where there are an awful lot of Jameses and an awful lot of Christophers. So I'll try and keep you up to date with the names and the places we go as well. But um, what we find out is that as well as the um, what you have on the screen here, uh, which is from 1718, we also have um, this example. Excuse me, start that bit again. James Clitheroe produces this in 1718 because he's drawing up a perspective bridegroom's valuation of Boston Manor, uh, the estate for his eldest son, James. Um, and after detailing all of the things that the house uh, had as part of its estate, he valued it, this is in 1718, at 1,878 pounds. What's great though, is that the Clitheroe's keep updating us about the estate and more importantly, what it produces. So James went on to update these records that he started and in 1722, we know that he adds information that there is a bakehouse on site, that there is a, this is one of my um, favorite descriptions, also a large and convenient brew house with hard stone mill to grind malt from whence pipes may be drunk and conveyed to our cellars. Um, we have lots of descriptions of what's on site from James. 
he talks about a large dovecot, three large barns, three stables, a straw loft, and very interestingly, as part of his estate, four granaries. So across it, you have an enormous amount of production. He estimates that he has six acres under his direct control, and the rest of this is rented out to those various tenant farmers, the largest of which seems to be Boston Farm, which also has a lumber house as part of it. The area was, um, as well as farmland, forested as well. Um, he goes on to describe that he has um, a small greenhouse and a garden, garden orchard um, with walks and a stew pond and about five fish ponds, all well stocked and paled in five acres. It does seem that the house has had medieval fish ponds that um, just from our historic record have uh, predated the building of the site uh, that's here. And those appear on multiple maps, some of which we'll see and they change as well, which is very interesting. But the idea of fish ponds um, seems to date right back to those 11th century dates that we had at the start. I'm gonna move on now to show you a little bit of um, the makeup itself. So we're on a slightly later uh, map here, but just to give you a sense of where we are, um, this is um, the map showing the whole of the West, of London, well, a large portion of the West of London uh, from 1745 by John Roke. But if we zoom in slightly, you can see I've highlighted the section of land uh, here that we're talking about, which is the historic estate. So this isn't the 1745, but this seems to be the boundaries of the estate roughly marked as we go. And if I zoom in again, this is that highlighted area here. Uh, this road, which is Boston Manor Road, is a very old road and it seems to have bounded the estate on that side. And you can see the river falling down and Boston House marked there. I'm going to move on to talk about this James Clitheroe, another James Clitheroe, um, from whom we know an enormous amount. Um, we know from James's own records, uh, from his household expenses, and payments to farms for produce that was used in the house. So James tells us an awful lot about, me, about what's available in the house. He talks about 11 turkeys being killed. So this is from an 1821 record of 11 turkeys, 73 fowl, 1,100 eggs, uh, 1,073 pounds of mutton, 523 pounds of lamb, um, 1,014.5 uh, pounds of pork and 518 pounds of butter, which is an absolutely enormous um, amount of food that's consumed by the house in 1821. But we've got other sources as well, and we have the letters of Mary Clitheroe, um, who writes a series of letters to a number of people, and in that she mentions what is being produced on the estate. She talks about a kitchen garden in one and a half acres, um, which was so productive that we find it enables us to give away quantities um, of food she's referring to there. And maybe Mary also gives us a bit more insight into the farm as well. Um, she talks about how her, her brother is doing, that's, that's James we're talking about. And she says in uh, 1837, my brother has been quite refreshed by, in his energies by the harvest. His farm in hand th of 300 acres, so we think that's all of the farmland associated with the estate, Never will I find the crops, and with this usual look, we will finish before the heavy rains. So the harvest is still, as we get into the 19th century, a huge part of what's going on at the estate. Um, the farms also include in James Clitheroe's probate inventory, um, where we've got details of what livestock there were. Um, there are nine cows, a two-year-old bull, heifers, a brown cart horse, three calves, 30 fowl, five turkeys, seven guinea fowl, a sow, five pigs, two breeding sows, and all manner of farming equipment. To give you a sense of what we're looking at, uh, this is the 1838 representation. You still see quite a lot of wooded area. The estate is changing, the area around the house in particular, being given over to slightly more formal parkland 
rather than agricultural land at this point. But that doesn't mean um, that we're not talking about an enormous amount of things. So a reminder here of some, uh, what James purchased um, from the farms here, but James isn't just purchasing uh, from the local farmers. He's bringing in exotic things for the house as well. And this is a sort of compiled list uh, through the 1820s and into the 1830s of some of the things that are being bought for the house, being uh, brought in in terms of food and drink. And as tastes changed and as mobility changes, by this point, um, the area is not the uh, long out of London. The railways have come. The um, Grand Union Canal has long been built at this point. So you have a spreading London, which is heading in this direction uh, to the well-established Brentford. Uh, and you have this fantastic list of things. Um, we've got an inventory list from 1847 as well, so a little later than this, um, which lists some of the things that are still here. Um, a beer cellar, uh, where there are 18 hogshead of beer, and wine of 34 dozen sherry, 40 dozen Madeira, 65 port, three dozen claret, and five dozen bottles of odd wine. Um, to give you more of a sense of what we're looking at, so this is the 19th century complex, and all of this stuff um, is not coming into the house. So this is the uh, historic highlighted house in pink there. Uh, with 507 on the reference. Don't worry about that for our purposes here. But just to say that the buildings you see that are marked in grey are all of the service buildings. And a lot of what those service buildings are doing is processing food for the house, is preparing things for use in the house. So we have a map, a hand-drawn well, hand map here, which details the uses of those various bits of the building. Um, so the main house isn't shown here, the main house is just off to the top left, but what you do have is an enormous list of functions that are going on, and to make life a little bit easier, I've marked those up to show what they are. Um, what we have here with the chicken house, um, with the bake house, which now seems to have become very close to the scullery, um, you have the dairy for processing what's coming in, I want to draw your attention to the brew house in the bottom right. There's been mentions of brew house on site um, all the way through the Clitheroe's records, which is not uncommon. Um, at that point, you've got to remember that the proliferation of brew houses uh, was necessary because you can only really transport beer as far as you can go in one day because it just would not have been able to keep at that point. So brewing is something that's done on a domestic scale from the first point and it's not unusual for a house of this size to have brew houses but what we do know is that the house seems to have had its own beer pipe which runs quite a considerable distance and we've actually found as part of the refurbishment of the house that we've been doing over the last few years um, a part of this beer pipe which runs from where uh, there was a later gatehouse um, underground and into the kitchen cellars um, so they had beer being run effectively on tap into the cellars and being stored there. And we saw that uh, list from the 1830s with the beer cellar had 18 hogs head of beer in. Well, it seems that all of that would have been produced from the beer house and stored in barrels in the basement. It's worth talking though about, um, as we come towards the end of the talk, the notorious thing which would um, put pressure on a great house like this in the state, which is a royal visit. And in 1834, Boston Manor House had such a uh, visit. King William IV and Queen Adelaide had been friends with the Clitheroes um, at the time and knew them well. They became um, the first royals uh, to, the first commoners to host them at their home. So royalty being hosted by commoners in this grand house and of course, the meal um, becomes a central part of that. They come for dinner. They don't stay overnight. So dinner is the focus. We don't have a menu, but we do have those letters of Mary Clitheroe that tell us what happened at the dinner. Um, 
she speaks helpfully and unhelpfully in setting the scene, but not telling us what's being consumed. When she says, as to the dinner, it was so perfect that it was impossible to know a single thing on the table. And that, you know, must be, ter must be termed a proper dinner for such a party. My brother gave carte blanche to Sir Edward Kerrison's Englishman cook, and to give him his due, he gave us as elegant a dinner as I've ever seen. So we don't know what they uh, consumed in terms of food, but we do know what they consumed in terms of drink, because Mary talks about, never was less wine drunk at dinner, and I cannot estimate, but I think six pounds, I think, must cover that. We had two men cooks, for he brought his friend, and we got all that we asked for. Really, I think we were let off very well at 50 pounds. So give you a sense of what 50 pounds would have bought you in the 1830s, if you convert that into modern purchasing power. You're talking about a £7,000 dinner for the evening. So Boston Manor has gone from having a history of producing goods, continuing to consume its own goods, but also um, embracing new appetites and bringing in food and drink to the estate. And that, the end of what I want to say about food and drink today. Thank you very much for listening. If you're interested in Boston Manor and want to find out more, there's some ways you can get in touch with us. We're going to reopen uh, this summer after several years of closing and an enormous refurbishment program, making the house look as good, I think, as it's looked for a considerable amount of time. And just to say thank you for allowing us to be part of this series and to flag to everybody that this is, of course, part of that series of 14, all of these available on YouTube uh, for you to consume. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk.